Hello and welcome back to April Space 7.17, the house at the bottom of the sky. We are back. Skies don't have bottoms, idiot. That's called the ground. We've already talked about how you're on for nice, because like, there's much better people in the comments who enjoy April Space, so um, maybe keep your comments in your pocket. In my pocket? Okay, yeah. I'll stuff them down in there. We should. I would love to have a guest on to read April Space so I could rest my weary throat. Well, I've um, been... because you've voiced this for I've, his 14 pages. <sighs> you joke. You're fucking kidding me. <laughs> it's 14 pages? When it's 14 oh. pages of Muzazi, there's nary a complaint. <laughs> yeah, that's because that's Muzazi. You were the loathsome dung eater of web serial <laughs> offense. You did. <laughs> we yet live. Shagan Hadrian, the backstabber. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's do this. <coughs> the hurricane stopped, and Dragon Hadrian's heart almost leapt out of his chest. In an instant, Masadora had used those rocket boots to zoom right into Dragon's face. His visage contorted in utter fury, his sword lifted high over his head. Corpse! Masadora croaked, and the sword came down. However, it never reached Dragon's skull. The dreadful smashing of flesh and bone never came. His life continued, unimpeded. The reason for this, needless to say, was that in the instant before Eli Masador could land the finishing blow, his entire body dissipated into electric blue aether. Even the sword he'd been swinging disappeared. Dragon let out a heavy breath. Gemini shotgun, he slurred, as if reminding himself that he'd somehow survived this. That had been a close one. Painfully, unacceptably close. Dragon had only survived by using Gemini's shotgun the same way he'd once used it to catch a falling Ruth. It had worked back then, allowing him to save her before she became a bloody smear. But, hang on, I'm getting fucked okay. by the movement. Uh, <laughs> before she became a bloody smear, but this time it had been a gamble. Eli Masadora wasn't quite as willing. Dragon had no doubt that if the other man had even a spark of Aether to resist with, this little maneuver would have been impossible. It was still an ordeal. Dragon could feel it on the edge of his consciousness, like a migraine creeping over the surface of his brain. Masadora's mind was writhing, trying to pull itself out of the web Dragon had dragged it into. He put a hand to his head as he staggered to his feet, stumbling over to meet Skipper. The pain was gradually increasing, like a trained boxer was trying to punch their way out of his skull. How much longer could he hold this? Ten seconds? Twenty? This is his fucking JoJo moment. <laughs> it wouldn't be for long, at any rate. He reached Skipper, and the old man put heavy hands on his shoulders, his usual grin weary in some way Dragon couldn't describe. Ew. Okay, kid! He huffed, ignoring the blood oozing from his own myriad wounds. Dragon shook his head as quickly as he could without triggering vomiting. Masadora was almost out. Even without Aether, his sheer force of will was terrifying. We need to get on the tram! He rasped, his words clumsy as he focused most of his attention on restraining Masadora. If he timed things right, it should be leaving for its next stop within the next couple of seconds. Needless to say, none of the people in there had the courage to get out on this one. Skipper nodded without any more questions, wrapping an arm around Dragon to support him as the two of them staggered towards the open tram. The civilians inside, clearly just as terrified of them as their opponent, moved away to either side of the carriage, their faces pale and their eyes wary. Skipper, for his part, offered a lazy salute as they stepped inside. Just a couple of monorail inspectors, folks! He said unconvincingly, Don't mind us! Dragon was at his limit. If he didn't act, Masadora would reappear right next to them inside the tram. The doors beeped as they began to close. He wouldn't get a better chance. Gemini shotgun! In the second before the tram doors closed shut, Dragon launched Masadora forth, infusing the manifested body with further aether to make him fly farther and harder. He went zooming out through the doors, slamming hard against a pillar back on the platform. Dragon had hoped to see if he was still moving, to confirm if he'd managed to get a kill. But before he could check, the tram was already on the move, the ruined platform replaced by the darkness of the tunnel. And a second after that, the flaring lights of the city. I thought... What surprised me here is I thought they were going to release him as a shotgun right as the tram started running so he'd get, like, ran over. I'm surprised they used the tram to flee and just threw him out. But maybe that would be too gruesome for Dragon. Well, he's not really got access to the place the tram is going to hit, really, because it's already there. Right. He slumped down into a free seat, Skipper collapsing next to him. The two of them panted for breath. I think... Trigon wheezed. I think we need to go to another hospital. Skipper wiped some, some of the blood out of his eyes. Yeah, 
he replied, looking down at the red liquid. I think you're right. Appreciating the long-required rest, Dragon fumbled in his pocket, ignoring the worried looks of those around him, and fished out his script, holding it to his ear as he called Ruth. Their efforts to find Serena had been a bust, but maybe she and Rico had had more luck. It rang once, twice, thrice, but no answer. Dragon gulped. Had they gotten into a similar situation? Don't worry, kiddo. Skipper waved a shaking hand, noticing the concerned expression on Dragon's face. Earth can look after herself. What about Rico? He hesitated a moment. Earth can look after herself. Three years ago. Tiny Garden, the teacher asked, leaning on his hand as he sat cross-legged on the floor. That's a unique name for it. Rico uh, shrugged, just some staring down at like, I know you have way no way of knowing this, but I would maybe go for a bit more of a chill voice. <laughs> Tiny Garden, the teacher yeah, exactly. asked, leaning on his hand as he sat cross-legged on the floor. That's a unique name for it. Rico shrugged, staring down at that same floor. The two of them were alone in the family gymnasium for their weekly tutoring session, the only sounds outside being the occasional tweets of passing birds. Despite the grim work they were doing, there was a strangely peaceful feeling to this place. Is there a reason you've chosen that name specifically? The teacher gently prodded, his voice utterly serene. I'd be interested to hear about it. Rico glanced up. The teacher wasn't going to let go of this. If he didn't get an answer to a question, he would keep prodding until he got tired of holding back. There was a quiet kind of relentlessness to him, a sort of paradoxical ferocity. His appearance was just as strange. He spoke with the voice of a fairly young man, maybe in his mid-twenties, and his eyes shone with youthful vigor, but his body was unmistakably elderly, wrinkled in thin arms, a face lined with years he didn't seem to have lived. Even the gentle smile on his face seemed strained. Rico wasn't quite sure where his mother had found this person, but apparently he was one of the best in the business of teaching Aether. I guess, Rico mumbled, I guess because bacteria are like little plants? I mean, not really, but you can think about them that way. Under a microscope, the shape sort of reminds me of the leaves, I guess. So if there's a bunch of them together, they're like a tiny gun. That's where the name comes from. The teacher nodded slowly. It seemed he was satisfied with this answer. He reached into his dusty gray robes, the only article of clothing Rico had seen him wear, and retrieved a vibrant green leaf. He carefully placed it on the smooth floor between them, and as he did, Rico caught a split-second glimpse of the word ALPHA tattooed on the front of his wrist. He was seriously weird. Is this like a character we've met before? Or have heard of? Okay. I hope you've been practicing, the teacher said quietly, retracting his hand. A shiver ran down Rico's spine. Oh, it hadn't been by choice, but he'd definitely been practicing. His mother made sure of that when she brought mice or rats or whatever made convenient test dummies for his ability. The stench of that practice wasn't forgotten so easily. Doesn't doesn't every Aether user design their own techniques? Yeah. Like, if he hates his ability so much, why did he make it so, like, vicious? Why did he focus on bacteria? Perhaps we will know. Rico held a wary hand over the leaf, sickly aether already coiling around the object. Tiny garden! For a second, the leaf simply twitched in the breeze. Then, as if it had been suddenly set upon by a horde of invisible insects, it began to crumble apart, fragments of green turning gray and dead as they collapsed into dust, and then collapsed further. All in all, the thing was reduced to a substance like steam in the span of ten seconds. Impressive, the teacher said, his tone utterly unchanged. You've completely eliminated it. You don't seem pleased, however. Rico went to reply, but the words caught in his throat. He found himself looking down at his hand, at the great shock that was still clinging there. It didn't need to be said. You dislike the ability we've developed? The teacher asked. Your mother wanted a power that could protect you from danger, and you said the same. Have you changed your mind, seeing the form that protection takes? Protect you from danger... That was all it came down to, really. Around a year ago now, Rico's mother Valentina had given birth to her second son, Alejandro, his little brother, and a month later one of her enemies had smothered him in a crib. She hadn't taken it well. The murderer had died in the worst way possible for a human being, and her drive to make sure the same thing didn't happen to her surviving son. No matter how much he vomited when he saw flesh bubble away, so long as he was alive, she'd be satisfied. It's a versatile ability. The teacher continued. We've trained to use it in a specifically macabre way, but the ability to manipulate bacteria can be used for a wide range of purposes. You're lucky to be capable of such range. Rico glanced up. What do you mean? 
The teacher smiled thinly. May I demonstrate my ability? I think that will illustrate my point well. Rico couldn't deny that he was curious about this man. His mother had hired for him to teach Rico Aether, and so... <laughs> I know you mean teach Rico Aether because of the capitalized. It sounds like his name is Rico Aether. <laughs> Rico Aether of Space. And so we didn't know much about him, save for the fact that he was good at what he did. If nothing else, knowing who he was dealing with would give him some small comfort in these sessions. Sure, I guess. The teacher reached out with one hand, extending his thumb towards Rico's forehead. May I? Sure, Rico repeated, a little more hesitantly. It was disconcerting to consciously put his defenses down like this. The teacher's cold thumb pressed against the spot directly between Rico's eyes for a second. Tiny sparks of dark purple aether crackling around the digit. Wait a minute, haven't we seen dark purple aether, or am I again insane? Uh, We've seen purple aether, but not dark purple aether specifically, I don't think. Okay, that's why I got confused. And we, you're bound to get the repeats, as been most people are ready, for, for example. <laughs> yeah, that's true. As he returned to his neutral sitting position, he brushed a lock of his long grey hair behind his ear. You unlocked your aether before I met you, he said gently, but I can see now that your aether core is fear. Whether fear of death, or fear of failure, or simple animal terror matters, matters not. I can't imagine awakening to such a thing was pleasant. He was right on the money. Rico blinked. How? It's my ability, the teacher replied by way of explanation. I assume replied, because the rest of this yeah. has been in past tense. Just by pressing my thumb against you like that, I instantly know your aether core. In most cases, it's a vital part of my curriculum. Rico frowned. He guessed for someone like this guy that ability could be worthwhile, but... Isn't that kind of useless? The words left his mouth before he could consider just how harsh they sounded. When the teacher sighed, resting his chin in his hands once more, he seemed to match his years much more. In that moment, he seemed to embody a kind of... disappointment? Not in Rico specifically, but just a general feeling that he'd been let down. I suppose you must think that, mustn't you? He sighed. After all, it's a useless ability for combat. Sorry, I didn't... The teacher cut him off with a raised palm. No need to apologize. It's the opinion of our age. But still, I ask you. Why is it, I assume, that we must think of Aether as solely a tool of violence? Or is it supposed to be why is it why? Yeah, it's fun. That works, it works both ways. Why is it why we must think of Aether as Oh, yeah, why is it we must... Sorry, that's right. You're right. <laughs> okay, just checking. Um... Uh, Rico chuckled. I mean, it's a power for fighting, right? Finally! We're getting to the lore I've been waiting for, because all this time you talk about Aether as like this meditative ancient art, but all we've seen is combat, and I was wondering, when are we going to get to the Aether lore? When are we going to get the Aether gurus that are like, I don't fight, I use Aether to do yoga. I'm so pogged. I'm ready for this. In what way is it a pa- I assume, is it a power for fighting? Aether is a power that can bypass the very rules of our existence, that can make dreams into reality. Why not use it to work the fields, to heal the flesh, to ponder the great mysteries of our world? It's said that the first Supreme even managed to preserve his consciousness following death itself, the teacher sighed. Does mankind's ambition truly only stretch to finding new ways of punching and kicking? Rico put a hand to his chin. The things the teacher was saying made sense, but they completely went away from the way Rico had been led to think about this power. To him, Aether was a dagger used to stab those who came too close. World's dangerous, he muttered, looking down at the ruined leaf. If people are using Aether to hurt others, then it's only natural, I guess, that people use Aether to defend themselves. I mean, it must be like a cycle or something, right? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yes, we're getting to the good shit! That spiel came out of his mouth clumsily, an inept attempt at imitating the teacher's thoughtful words, but the older man nodded in acceptance of what Rico had said. Since the beginning of time, he spoke softly, staring through the window at the bright sunlight outside. Humans have lied, killed, and stolen from one another. No matter what tools they've had at their disposal, that principle has never changed. Personally, I find it all terribly dull, but I suppose that's just the shape of this world. If you're so bored of it, why are you working for my family? You know they're not exactly uh, pacifists. The teacher cocked his head. 
There? Not we? Before Rico could reply, however, he went on, speaking as casually as if he was discussing the weather. I'm going to be dead soon, most likely. If I want to live my last couple of years in luxury, I require funds. It's for that reason alone that I work for such people. Oh, I, uh, guess that makes sense. Sunlight drifted in through the glass doors. The bird that had been incessantly tweeting outside flew away with the sudden billowing of wings. Still, the teacher closed his eyes. I wonder how long it'll take until you get bored of hurting people, too. Now, nah. all oh, this guy! You know what, Tan? I have a theory. Mm hmm? He mentioned he had, like, gray wrinkled skin, right? Yeah, he's like an old, he looks like an old guy. And I was remembering what the Supreme looked like. I bet this guy's, like, the former Supreme. Or maybe he's the Supreme now, even. Probably not. But, like, maybe, or, like, a relative of the Supreme? I don't know. I, I, I have theories. Oh, baby. Uh, popcorn. Now, as Ruth's blue bullet bullet slammed into Rico, streaking through the air like a firework, the pain and oblivion he'd expected did not come. Instead, strength began to well up inside him, a sense of power that he'd never experienced before. His aphid began to crackle vicariously, like a building thunderstorm. Go, Ruth grunted, her voice muffled by the scarf covering her mouth. Get us through. Every single one of his movements felt easier than it had ever been before. Even turning to look at the cloud of red gas in front of them was unnaturally fluid. It was as if he'd spent his whole life... (laughs) Here he goes in 60 FPS now. (laughs) It was as if he'd spent his whole life half awake, and now he just drunk his first cup of coffee. Ah, uh, you're a fool if you have a power that gives your enemies power, strength through a plane. <laughs> mm, it was all just to trick you. Slices her throat. <laughs> Wait, I, my consciousness has just gone berserk. I'm still over there. <laughs> Even blinking gave him a sense of unparalleled freedom, like it could barely be held back by his physical form. He'd heard of it before, this sensation. Was this an aether burn? At first he didn't quite understand what was going on. If this was an aether burn, his body should have been collapsing under the pressure. But a sense of vitality radiating through him suggested nothing of the sort. He only understood when he took another glance at Ruth. As he watched, steam began gently drifting up from the edge of her scarf. Her bronze breastplate began to crack just a little, tiny fractures appearing on its surface. He could even hear the wood of the musket she was holding creak with discomfort. Just from looking, he had worked out that the armor she manifested around her body gave her different powers. The one she'd shown off so far, the dark metal like the ribs of a skeleton, gave her enhanced strength and speed beyond normal infusion. This new set, however, seemed to have a much more specialized power. It forced others into an aether burn, then took the damage in their stead. A good way of getting around the rules of aether. If that armor was taking damage, Rico would only imagine the boost would end when it finally demanifested. He couldn't waste time mentally applauding. Turning back to the stationary cloud of glass, gas, Rico held his ar- hands See, out in front of him. That's clever, because not only does it have a time limit, but she can't really use her other armor and be helpful while she's boosting someone. She's kind of yeah. like on a cooldown. Ruth cooldown. Rico held his hands out in front of him as if waiting to catch something from above. His sickly green aether ran across his arms, coalescing and brightening in his palms. Commands ready to be sent out like a net. Clean the air, scrub it of toxins, convert the poison into normal oxygen and carbon dioxide. Tiny garden. His power blasted out, the haze of aether colliding with the poison. And then, like he was drawing back a set of curtains, Rico pulled his hands back, the poison ripped apart in the time it took for him to breathe again. The way to the bathroom. The way to the bathroom was unimpeded, the only signs of any obstacle being the faded wisp- fading wisps of red already being devoured by the bacterial horde. With the lights destroyed, the place seemed like a tunnel of darkness, but that didn't stop Ruth from charging right on in. She wasn't the bolt of speed she'd been in the, wearing her previous armour, but she was still plenty fast, sprinting with that musket clutched between her hands, her resolute eyes unblinking in the dark. Rico hesitated for a moment before following her. Through the slight illumination the collective aether provided, Rico could see that the bathroom had been wrecked, so her vicio had smashed through the wall utterly when it first attacked Ruth after all. One of the cubicles seemed to have received the brunt of destruction, the entire unit annihilated, parts of it converted into what looked like swords, opening up a hole into the plumbing tunnels below. This ain't gonna be big on dignity, Ruth grunted. Let's go. And with that, she hopped in. Rico sighed, braving himself for the bad day to continue, before he followed after her. Funny enough, the tunnel was brighter than the actual bathroom, dim maintenance lights built into the walls, stretching off in either direction. 
In the distance, the slightest suggestion of two humanoid figures could be seen, running away from the position. Keiko and Ruth's friend, no doubt. Until now, Ruth had been content to sit back. This whole thing had nothing to do with him, after all. But now he wanted answers. His cousin wasn't even supposed to be on this station. With everything happening, the Hunter game, Uncle Jock's death, he wasn't about to let this mystery go unanswered. He'd get the answers out of Keiko and they'd all make it out of this safe. He went out to chase after them, but Ruth was already way ahead of him. Before she could take so much, he could take so much as a single step, she grabbed him by the collar and began sprinting down the tunnel, holding her right in front of him. He felt another a bullet from that uh, muzzle, not muzzle, it's musket, musket strike in the back, his earth aether flaring around him. She sends more poison, Ruth roared, a voice almost swallowed by the air pressure. Get rid of it! Fantastic. he have been upgraded from kidnapped victim to human shield. <laughs> oh my god, Dragon moment? <laughs> Well, he could sit. Dragon got off fairly easy. He never got used as a human shield. Oh, I thought he had it. I thought, like, when Ruth was first taking him back to the shuttle, she was doing that against Muzazi. I think she hit someone with him. No, no, no. He oh, yeah, that's what it was. I think he <laughs> she used him as a projectile. She's like, Gemini Dragon. Well, he could certainly manage that. As the two of them rushed forward, gaining on Keiko and Serena at incredible speeds. Rico saw a cloud of yellow smoke coiling towards them, spiralling in the air like some kind of flying serpent. He instantly threw his hands forward again. Clean! The complex commands he'd transmitted the first time were now simplified to a single directive. Those instructions were encoded in his green aether, which lanced out for his fingers and swarmed the air like a horde of buzzing insects. The poison didn't stand a chance. Um, d -d -d he vanished completely as um, Rico's body rushed through it, and then, just like that, they had caught up. As the two of them burst through the disappearing cloud, Rico could see Keiko's shocked expression below, her eyes widening. The centipede on her shoulder lunged at them, but too late. Rico felt Ruth's grip slacken, releasing him as the two of them dropped to the ground. Her usual set reappeared as Ruth's fall transition transitioned into a flip, and in the very instant she crossed past with the attacking centipede, a single swipe of her claws severed its head from its body. The corpse of the beast vanished into vicious red aether. Uh, and I'll popcorn for this bit. <laughs> You! Keiko began, but no more words left her mouth. A kick to the stomach from Ruth sent her doubling over, choking for breath. And then Ruth whirled her, whirled her around, pulling her arms behind her back. There was a flash of red as one of Ruth's gauntlets vanished, only to reappear on Keiko. Both her hands were trapped in the confines of the cramped single glove, a makeshift pair of handcuffs. A second kick sent the younger woman down to her knees. Jesus, Ruth! We got you dead to rights! <laughs> She tries anything, mess her up, Ruth growled, tossing Keiko over to Rico. He reluctantly nodded. The other person they'd been chasing, Ruth's friend, had slid into the shadows, but as Ruth approached, they returned to the light. The blonde girl, Serena, glared at her, her lip wobbling. What are you doing, Miss Ruth? Serena asked, her voice full of resentment. Why are you getting in the way? Ruth scowled. Me? What the hell are you doing? Going along with people you don't even know because, what, they promised to help you get revenge on this hot guy? Serena's nostrils flared. Don't say that name! Fine, I won't. But what are you thinking? Oh my god, Ruth's becoming Serena! <laughs> Ruth spread her arms wide as if to illustrate the ludicrous position they were in. At least she wants to help! All of you just want me to wait! Serena frowned, the frustration in her voice building as she went. I can't wait, Miss Ruth! How the heck can I wait? I need to protect... No! By the end, she was nearly screaming. I love me how Max Anger Serena still doesn't say how. <laughs> how the heck? Dude, when Serena finally says fuck, that's when you know shit gets real. She doesn't even know what that means. <laughs> Rico had to look away, focusing on keeping Keiko restrained. He felt like a voyeur. Being here, watching this, the angry lines on Ruth's face relaxed just a little, and she sighed. That's what we want too, Serena, she said kindly. We want you to be safe. Bruno, too. But you're just running off without thinking what you're going to do at all. Tell me, where if you knew where Cot was right now, what would you do? Uh, I think it would be thinking of what you're going to do at all. Yeah, but that's not what Ruth would say. She'd say it wrong. Okay, that's fair. Serena frowned as if the answer was obvious. I'd go there and I'd kill him. How? With this! Serena lifted the sword in her hand, the blade glinting in the dim light. That bit of foolishness seemed to be the last Ruth had patience for. She suddenly stepped forward, a growl leaking out of her throat, and slapped the sword out of Serena's hand. The clattering of the metal echoed down the hallway. 
Ruth planted both her hands on Serena's shoulders as she roared, You're the one putting Bruno in danger, you idiot! Her eyes wide with outrage, Serena went to headbutt Ruth, only to be stopped by a gauntleted hand. I wouldn't do that! She- Wait. Oh no, that's her speaking. I wouldn't do that! She screamed, thrashing against Ruth's grip. You already have! Overcoming Serena's strength, Ruth pushed her down to the ground, looking down at the fallen girl with a mixture of fury and concern. There was, there was a resounding clash as she thumped her fist against the metal wall in frustration. You think you're the only one who's felt like this? She asked. You think I've never wanted to kill someone so much it burns? Want to rip them apart? I've wanted it and I've done it! Let me tell you, when you've done it and you've lost everything else you had along the way, it still... Burns! It never stops! He hurt Bruno! Serena screamed, her tears streaked face looking up, her teeth bared in anger. He hurt me! He's still hurting you, and you're letting him! Serena looked like she was about to scream some other threat before she simply drove her fist into the ground. Once, twice, then again, until the again and again, until the aether sparked away and was replaced by blood. Finally, she stopped, her body heaving with sobs. What? She breathed. What am I supposed to do then? Ruth crouched down next to her, pulling her into an embrace. Even with that tender gesture, however, her eyes glared straight ahead. You stay with us, and then we'll kill him. Popcorn. The security center certainly was a sight to behold. Scout chuckled to himself as he turned on the spot, taking in the cavernous space. The room was cylindrical, lit only by blue panels on the floor and the holographic monitors lining the walls. Views of every district on the cradle, from crowded streets to deserted alleyways. Tinny audio mingled together from each display, crowding together, crowding together even in this uh, massive chamber. Um, with the similarly holographic keyboards that floated below, one could input any location they wanted to look at. No doubt they allowed access to the silver vision system too. It was all according to the schematics. Chloe kept her arms crossed, her eyes tracking the patrolling guards. This place wasn't actually manned. Having potential voyeurs in your government spying facility was an invasion of privacy too far, it seemed. So all security was handled by automatics. They were actually fairly comical looking. Metal cylinders with spindly arms and legs, clutching plasma rifles. These two were members of the Oliphant clan, whose patriarch had funded the renewal of this place, so they were automatically granted access. Some hacking efforts from Deceit's, su- Deceit's source had seemed to it that he didn't have to worry either. In fact, he was on call of that source right now. He held a script to his ear as he strode around the room, running his fingers through the holographic screens, imagining the fizzling sensation he would have felt if he had nerves. These idiots really thought he was talking some sort of mission control on a starship outside the station. Which ones do you have with you? Cot asked, his voice inaudible to all but the seats. We reached the silver vision control room, replied the seats, awaiting the access codes. Scout Oliphant Dawkins and Chloe Oliphant Escassi-Offier. They don't suspect me at all. Deceit's unique ability wasn't very good for combat, unless he was fighting a shit-stained cogitant anyway, but was uniquely uniquely useful when it came to espionage. He could encode... I think probably a better word for this is encrypt, actually. He could encrypt information directly into his speech, transmitting unrelated connotations through casual greetings, or giving the impression that he was trustworthy through every word that left his mouth. I actually think encode works better for this because while hiding information does follow encryption, encoding is like that idea of making him seem more trustworthy. Like he's directly the information that he's putting inside his speech is like conveying a different meaning. Yeah, exactly. I guess That's either works, but I, I like encode a lot. I see. Cut left. Access code is uh, B2292H6711. That'll get you into Silver Vision. Make sure they're all in one place before you do it. Oh, God. (laughs) Lazy asshole. He was sitting back at home, sitting on that damn metal coffin while the seat was out doing the actual work. He briefly considered angling for a change of management instead of this busy work, but quickly discarded the notion. More than likely, that was just arrogant speaking. He didn't say any of that, though. Appreciated, the seat said sharply. I'll make sure you get... Wait, he also has arrogance inside him? What did he mean by this? I... Is... Because I'm curious, because if Cot doesn't have Deceit right now, he he would have to be brutally honest if anyone confronted him about what he's doing, right? So I wonder if Deceit's, like, planning a personality coup. Well, he thought about it for a second, though, but he seemed to, to reconsider very quickly. 
I'll make sure you get the collective message too. Should be a laugh. Well, Cot replied, his voice naturally much more dull. Enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting to hear back. The call ended. As the seat returned to the script to his pocket, he called out the code he'd been given to scouts. The younger man began tapping away at one of the keyboards, already concocting the message he'd send out to his family members, already regging the lure to see he would use to pull them in. Cot swiped the screen on the script, casting a holographic display right in front of him. After he'd started participating in the Hunter game, he'd moved the coffin out of that dusty hotel into an apartment he'd rented under an alias. So a little recap on this. We don't know why, but Cot apparently takes his big coffin with him everywhere. Oh, interesting. He's a vampire. Still, he kept the lights off. He didn't want anyone knowing he was here, or that anyone was here. He didn't like to look at the, even like to look at the coffin, even as he sat on it. The scratching he could hear from inside it was more than enough for him. The thing in the dark hated, after all. The broadcast began, a message manually being sent to a specific list of people. Distorted by poor signal, it blurred out in the dark apartment. The image of Scout, Chloe and Deceit flickered in and out of view. This is Scout here. Uh, Scout Oliphant Olim- Darkens. Well, you know. Popcorn. Roy grinned down in the script as he listened to the message, the artificial wind blowing through his hair. He stood atop a skyscraper, one leg up on the ledge, having stopped when the message had started. He'd been searching for the kids through the night, leaping over buildings in a single bound, and it turned out Scout had been working hard all the while. What a man he was! Chloe's with me, too. His son's voice continued. We're in the Silver Vision Center, the big uh, security tower. Roy's eyes gazed up. The building his son was talking about was visible from here, a needle stretching up. No windows, no doors, a place where only automatics lived. Well, the cradle was an inverted globe, so from... Well, what the... F- I can't even comprehend what an inverted globe is. Well, it's like, like, imagine the Earth, but the our civilization wrapped around the inside rather than the outside. Like, hollow. Oh, okay. So if you look up, so you can Roy- see, like, China... I got you, I got you. So from Roy's position, the tower was actually stretching down. The top of the tower terminated directly in the center of the sphere, like the core of the brain that was the cradle, a house at the bottom of the sky. He grinned. Seemed like a good workout. Carla looked down at her script, listening to the message as her private car drove through the skies of the cradle. The neon lights of the city blared through the windows, filtered through layers of bulletproof glass and metal. Those that had been gathered at the elephant compound had scattered, across, had scattered after the place had been attacked by one of the Hunter Game participants, the maniac who called himself King Smile. Along with a small army of traitorous bodyguards, they clashed with those bodyguards who'd remained loyal. Valentina had left with her men in one car, Carla had left in the other alone. If this is actually getting through, Scout was saying, if we want to survive, we need to come back together. If you're able to, make your way here. Change destination! She barked to her automatic driver. Central monitor in tower. I, I forgot her voice and changed it. It was a little through. less chirp. It was, it was that accent, but less chirpy. It was Central like monitor cheer. in yeah. tower. I, I hope I get to see you all soon. The message ended, Rico's screen flicking back to black. The only sound in the narrow tunnel was their myriad breathing, echoing in the confined space. I have the feeling you, you, lo- you found a newfound love for the words myriad and voyeur this week. <laughs> when writing this chapter. They're good words. Uh, Echoing in the confined space. There had been three people in that message, standing in that darkened room. He recognized Scout and Chloe, of course, but that third person, that young man with long orange hair dressed in a blue blazer. He didn't recognize him, but someone clearly did. Among the breathing in the tunnel, Serena's was by far the heaviest. Cut! She hissed, staring at the black screen. Immediately, she went to stand up and begin running, only to be stopped by a heavy hand on the shoulder from Ruth. No, she said forcefully. No. This time, we kill him together. Let me call Dragon. He can can shoot him in the back. (laughs) Oh, my God. That was a good chapter. A little crazy. Yeah. There was a lot. How do you feel about it, hearing it back? I'm happy with it. I'm pretty happy with it. I think it's a good chapter. I love that we got some more Aether lore. Because the way you had described it in the beginning of the series, I was like, I want to see more of, like, the deep lore of, like, Aether used to be something else. And now it's a tool of war, and I got some of that. And that was really cool. And I have a new character I'm interested to learn more about. I really liked the conflict between Serena and Ruth there. I I wish I could have done it better justice with my voices. Um, But I feel like that was a really powerful moment. And uh, I also... Yeah, those were the big ones. I didn't think the Dragon Skipper scene was bad either. But yeah, yeah but that, a lot, there were a lot of good scenes. That was just them doing stuff. 
Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Um, this is a full 35 minute recording. We got another chapter to do today. Uh, it's so much slower. Don't catch- worry. Uh, I hope so. We will catch you guys soon. Bye. Bye.